A Rolls-Royce Merlin engine contains 11,000 individual components. At maximum power, the pistons inside are accelerating from 0 to 60 miles per hour and back to 0 50 times every second. The internal stresses are high enough to stretch steel like toffee. Most engineers design engines to run. Alfred Cyril Lovesy designed them to break. To the designers in the drawing office, a failure was a mistake. To Lovesy, it was data. He believed you could not calculate the limit of a machine on a slide rule. You had to find it physically. You had to run the engine until the connecting rods snapped and the bearings melted. Only then did you know the truth. This philosophy, brutal, pragmatic and data-driven, is what separated the design men from the development men. And in 1941, this philosophy became the only thing standing between the Royal Air Force and total obsolescence. The war had moved to the stratosphere. The German Focke Wolf 190 was flying at altitudes where the air was too thin for the RAF's engines to breathe. The British pilots were fighting in slow motion, their engines wasting for oxygen, outclimbed and outgunned. The RAF didn't need a new engine. They didn't have time for one. They needed the existing Merlin engine to do something physics suggested was impossible. Double its power output in air that was barely there. Lovesy didn't go to the drawing board, he went to the test shed. Alfred Cyril Lovesy joined Rolls-Royce in 1923. He was a graduate of Bristol University, but his education truly began at Hucknall. Hucknall was the company's flight test establishment, a place where the clean theories of the design office met the dirty reality of the atmosphere. Lovesy became the master of this domain. Unlike many engineers who preferred the safety of the ground, Lovesy insisted on going up. He logged hundreds of hours in the rear seats of test bombers, monitoring gauges, adjusting fuel mixtures in mid-air, and diagnosing vibrations with his own hands. He understood that an engine behaves differently at 300 miles per hour than it does bolted to a concrete floor. This experience was vital because, by 1941, the Merlin engine had hit a wall. The early Merlins used a single-stage supercharger, one large fan to suck in air and compress it. It worked perfectly at low altitude. But at 30,000 feet, the air pressure is less than a third of what it is at sea level. The single fan simply couldn't spin fast enough to pack the thin air into the cylinders. The solution was obvious on paper. Use two fans. A two-stage supercharger. The first fan compresses the air, and the second fan compresses it again. But physics is cruel. When you compress air, you heat it. Compressing it twice heated the intake charge to over 200 degrees Celsius. If you feed 200 degree air into a petroleum engine, it doesn't just burn, it detonates. It melts the pistons in seconds. The designers were stuck. They could get the air pressure, but they couldn't handle the heat. Enter Stanley Hooker and A.C. Lovesy. Hooker was the mathematician who calculated the aerodynamics of the fans. Lovesy was the pragmatist who had to make it fit inside a Spitfire. Lovesy's team integrated an intercooler. It was a liquid-cooled radiator inserted directly into the induction system, sandwiched between the supercharger and the engine block. It was a plumbing nightmare. It requires a separate water pump, a header tank, and a radiator mounted under the wing. It added weight to a fighter plane that was already heavy. Critics in the Ministry of Aircraft Production argued it was too complex, too heavy, and too slow to produce. Lovesy ignored them. He focused on the dynamometer readings. The intercooler dropped the temperature intake from 200 degrees to just 60. The air entering the engine was now dense, cool, and volatile. The result was the Merlin 61. At 30,000 feet, the old engine produced 500 horsepower. Lovesy's new engine produced 1,020. It wasn't a marginal gain. It was a 100% increase in combat power. When the Merlin 61-powered Spitfire Mark IX arrived in July 1942, the Luftwaffe's altitude advantage vanished. The German pilots, 
accustomed to looking down on the RAF, suddenly found the British fighters above them. Lovesy continued to refine the system. He pushed the boost limits, the manifold pressure, higher and higher. He introduced 150 octane fuel to prevent knocking at these extreme pressures. By 1944, the Merlin 66 was operating at boost pressures that would have blown the cylinder heads off a 1940 engine. The piston engine had reached its zenith. Lovesy had taken a 1930s design and, through rigorous scientific development, doubled its output. But as the war in Europe ground to a halt in 1945, a new sound began to emanate from the test beds at Barnoldswick. It was not the rhythmic thrum of pistons, but a high-pitched, continuous scream. The era of the propeller was over, the gas turbine had arrived, and AC Lovesy, the master of the piston engine, was about to find that his greatest challenge was not maintaining power, but preventing catastrophe. 1946. The war is over. The internal combustion engine, the piston, the crankshaft, the spark plug, is suddenly a relic. The future is the gas turbine. Sir Frank Whittle had invented the jet engine, and Rolls-Royce had industrialised it. But the early jets, like the Neen and the Derwent, relied on centrifugal compressors. A centrifugal compressor works like a water pump. It flings air outwards to compress it. It is robust, simple and reliable but it has a fatal flaw. To get more power, the engine must get wider. A wide engine creates drag, and in the pursuit of speed, drag is the enemy. To break the sound barrier, aviation needed a new shape, a pencil-thin engine that could slide through the air with minimal resistance. This required a different, more volatile technology, the axial flow compressor. In an axial engine, the air does not change direction. It is forced through a series of spinning blades, stage after stage, squeezed into a smaller and smaller space in a straight line. Rolls-Royce bet their future on this concept. They called it the Avon. But the Avon was a disaster. While the piston engine is a mechanical device, the axial jet engine is an aerodynamic one. Each of those thousands of small blades is a wing. If the airflow over them is not perfect, they stall, just like an aircraft wing stalls. When a compressor stalls, the high-pressure air at the back of the engine violently escapes forward, out the front. It is called a surge. It sounds like a bomb going off. It can snap titanium blades like glass and destroy an engine in milliseconds. The Avon surges constantly. It was heavy, unreliable, and refused to start. The project was dying. Lovesy was appointed Chief Development Engineer for the Avon. He brought with him the discipline of the Merlin years. He did not care about the aerodynamic theory, he cared about the mechanical reality. He realised that the front of the engine and the back of the engine wanted to run at different speeds. At low RPM, the front blades were choking the engine with too much air. His solution was characteristically pragmatic. If the engine has too much pressure, bleed it off. Lovesy introduced automatic bleed valves. These were mechanical gates in the engine casing. At low speeds, they opened automatically, dumping excess air overboard to prevent a surge. As the engine sped up and stabilised, they snapped shut. He also attacked the airflow at the very front of the engine. He implemented variable inlet guide vanes. These were stationary blades at the engine's intake that could pivot, angling the air so it hit the spinning compressor blades at the optimal angle. These were not elegant aerodynamic fixes, they were heavy mechanical mechanisms. But they worked, the surging stopped, the Avon began to behave. With Lovesy's modifications, the Avon became the workhorse of the Cold War. It powered the Hawker Hunter, the English Electric Canberra, and the terrifyingly fast Lightning Interceptor. It was the first British engine to prove that the axial concept could be reliable. But the military was no longer the only client. The civilian world was waking up to the jet age. After the tragic structural failures of the early de Havilland Comet airliners, the British aviation industry was on its knees. 
To rebuild trust, the new Comet 4 needed an engine of absolute, unquestionable reliability. They chose the Rolls-Royce Avon. Lovesy oversaw the civilization of the military engine. He added noise suppressors. He implemented rigorous anti-icing systems. But most importantly, he focused on tired life. In military fighters, an engine might fly for a few hundred hours. In an airliner, it had to fly for thousands. Lovesy demanded that components be tested to cyclic fatigue, heated up, spun up, cooled down over and over again, simulating the cycle of takeoff and landing. He discovered that thermal shock, the rapid heating and cooling, was more damaging than constant speed. He redesigned the turbine blades with internal cooling channels, allowing them to survive temperatures higher than the melting point of the metal itself. In 1958, the Avon-powered Comet 4 completed the first commercial transatlantic jet crossing, beating the American Boeing 707 by weeks. The engine that had once exploded on the test stands was now carrying passengers from London to New York. By 1960, A.C. Lovesy was the Deputy Director of Engineering. He had shepherded Rolls-Royce from the piston era to the jet age. He had tamed the axial compressor. The company was now the first engine manufacturer in the world. The future seemed secure. Lovesy retired, believing his work was done. He was wrong. The greatest crisis in the history of Rolls-Royce was just a decade away, and it would require the old development man to come back from the wilderness one last time. The 1960s were a decade of limitless ambition. Aviation was scaling up. Boeing was building the 747 jumbo jet. Lockheed was building the TriStar. These leviathans required a new breed of engine, the high-bypass turbofan. Enormous, quiet, and efficient. The prize for winning this contract was the American market. The penalty for failure was bankruptcy. Rolls-Royce decided to gamble everything. They proposed the RB211. The design was revolutionary, a three-shaft engine. But to meet the weight targets promised to Lockheed, the engineers made a fatal decision. They decided that the massive fan blades at the front of the engine would not be made of titanium. They would be made of a new space-age composite material, carbon fibre. They called it Heifel. Heifel was lighter than aluminium and stronger than steel. It was the future. The company became intoxicated by the technology. They sold the engine to Lockheed based on the performance of these plastic blades. But Heifel had a weakness. It was brittle. When struck by a bird at takeoff speeds, the carbon blades didn't just bend, they shattered. Rain erosion stripped them bare. The technology was simply not ready. By 1970, the backup plan, titanium blades, was failing too. They were too heavy and the extra weight was cracking the engine casings. The RB211 was overweight, underpowered and late. The penalties from Lockheed began to mount. Rolls-Royce was losing millions of pounds a week. On February 4th, 1971, the impossible happened. Rolls-Royce, the symbol of British industrial excellence, declared insolvency. The company was nationalised by the government to save the defence of the realm. To salvage the RB211 programme, the government called Sir Stanley Hooker out of retirement. Hooker agreed, but he knew the problem wasn't just aerodynamic, it was mechanical. The engine was shaking itself to pieces. He needed the best mechanic in the world. He picked up the phone. Alfred Cyril Lovesy was 71 years old. He had been retired for seven years. He had no need to return, but the engine needed him. Lovesy, along with Arthur Rubra, formed a committee of one. They ignored the modern management structures. They bypassed the bureaucratic reports. Lovesy walked directly onto the shop floor. Lovesy's diagnosis was brutal. The engineers, obsessed with weight saving, had made the engine casing too thin. Under load, the engine was bending, causing the heavy titanium blades to scrape and shatter. He ordered the casings to be thickened. He added strengthening ribs. He famously told the weight engineers, it is better to have an engine that is heavy and works than an engine that is light and does not. 
He applied the lessons of the Merlin and the Avon. He looked for the stress points. He reinforced the mountings. He stabilized the airflow. It was a grueling summer. The old guard, men in their 70s, worked 14-hour days alongside apprentices in their 20s. Slowly, the vibration readings dropped. The thrust climbed. The bird strike tests were passed. The engine held together. In April 1972, the RB211 entered service. It was a masterpiece of engineering. It was quiet, fuel efficient, and incredibly robust. It arrived too late to save the old Rolls-Royce company from bankruptcy, but it saved the future. The RB211 became the grandfather of the Trent engine family. Today, if you fly across an ocean on a wide-body jet, there is a high probability you are being pushed by a descendant of the engine Lovesy fixed. Alfred Cyril Lovesy passed away in 1976. He left behind no famous patents, no flamboyant autobiography. His legacy is not written in books, but in the specific, rigorous methodology of development. The understanding that perfection is not drawn, it is forged in the fire of failure. He was the man who made things work.